According to an old Norse saga, Thor, the thunder god, went fishing on the open sea, accompanied by the giant Hymir. Willfully overhearing Hymir's warnings of the legendary beast that roamed the waters, Thor sailed too far. Using the torn off head of one of Hymir's bulls as bait, he threw his line into the water and soon felt a mighty tug. It was Jormungandr, the Middle Earth Serpent, and Thor's arch enemy. Described as a gigantic worm or snake, it was so large that it wrapped around the world, keeping it together. Hymir Fearing the end of the world if the monster was killed, cut the line, allowing the creature to retreat into the depths again, much to Thor's chagrin. At the end of times, it is said that Thor will once again face his ancient adversary in a final battle. there, you just heard part of the saga on the Norse god Thor facing a dragon-like foe. If you want to learn more about Thor, check out this video by my buddy Kogito. Now Thor's epic struggle doesn't stand on its own. Very similar stories of humongous sea serpents are found in mythologies all over Europe and Asia and laid the groundworks for what in medieval times developed into dragons. But from these archaic beginnings, how did we arrive at the winged, fire-breathing, monstrous reptilians that we nowadays imagine when thinking of dragons? That is actually an interesting story. The Middle-earth serpent wasn't the only primeval dragon in Germanic mythology, which includes Norse and Anglo-Saxon traditions. There was also Nilhok, a monstrous creature with a worm-like body that gnawed at the roots of Yggdrasil, the Tree of Life. And there was Favnir, guarding a gold treasure and who was eventually slain by the heroic Sigurd. Despite often being depicted as dragon-like in medieval Romanesque and later art, creatures like Nudhok and Favnir were originally called worms. Now this may sound odd in our modern ears, but to the Old Norse, these mythical monsters were classed together with all kinds of elongate creatures including snakes, earthworms, maggots, and even diseases. So basically anything bad was associated with wiggly and bendy beings of variable size, whether feasting on our bodies, dealing out venom, or being powerful bullies. And this original take on dragons is pervasive throughout ancient cultures in Europe and the Near East. Even the original Greek word of dracon was actually just another word for snake. Despite still regularly being referred to as a worm, a creature described in the Old English epic poem of Beowulf is already very much like the prototypical dragon. For one, it spews fire as opposed to the early Germanic forms that spit venom at most. And it is even capable of flight, with bat wings and all, as briefly mentioned in the story. Later, in medieval Europe, a common motive was that of the lindworm, a large two-legged serpent sometimes depicted with small wings and which basically looks like a small dragon. From very early on the age-old concept of giant often aquatic serpents was gradually being influenced by classical and Christian ideas evolving into the modern dragon. Where these extra abilities suddenly came from is uncertain but it could have been taken from several other mythological traditions. For instance, there's the Chimera from Greek mythology, described and depicted as a fusion of different animals. It was part snake, written as dracon, and could breathe fire. There's also the biblical Leviathan that is clearly described as a fire breather in the book of Job. As the worm or dragon in pre-Christian Europe already often was associated with evil, this tradition was presumably carried on in the church's imageries of the devil and hell fire. 
Dragons were basically recruited as a kind of demon and were as such readily associated with fire. As for flight, there is even less certainty, but winged serpents are both mentioned in the Bible as well as by the ancient Greek historian Herodotus. There has been a lot of speculation as to why so many different cultures arrived at the same motif, namely that of a serpentine monster of evil to be feared and slain. It is generally assumed that discoveries throughout the ages of fossil bones of dinosaurs and other extinct creatures fueled the idea of dragon-like monsters. There is also a theory that it is ultimately based on our fear of snakes as ingrained in our primate brains. Experiments on macaque monkeys show an instinctive fear reaction to snake pictures. However, that seems to be contradicted by the fact that the Chinese or Oriental dragons are not associated with evil, in contrast to the European or Western ones. The origin of Chinese dragons is shrouded in mystery and subject to many conflicting theories. But let us suppose that all of these imaginations were based on reports of actual living creatures that roamed the wide open spaces, forests, lakes and seas of Europe and Asia. In a follow-up video, I will take a speculative look at what dragons would be like if they were real. What kind of animals would dragons be? What of their evolution and anatomy? Stay tuned and we'll piece something together. This idea was suggested to me by YouTuber NameXplain. Go check him out. Thanks buddy. For now, bye bye.